We continue our podcast today of the Prophetic Writing Series. We're dealing with the book, The Beginnings. Our topic today is that the Israelites priests during the Babylonian captivity went to great lengths to make their contrivances plausible and added uh, writings into their Tanakh to support this. And um, we've shown that they uh, rewrote the Pentateuch. They, they, they commenced it with the Genesis account. They wrote perceived world history in there. And they created, uh, uh, they changed their history to, uh, to uh, fit into their survivalist strategy. They wanted to show that they moved from Egypt to a promised land in Canaan. And we saw that that was a contrivance. And uh, they wanted to uh, back up all the things that they were writing. And uh, part, of the, uh, part of the rewrite was the book of uh, Joshua and Judges. We show that uh, the elements within Joshua and Judges that show that they were rewritten. For instance, um, Judges speaks of the Ark of the Covenant still being with them at that time. And we show that the Ark of the Covenant only went missing about 50, 60, 70 years before the Babylonian captivity. So that shows that was written after that time and probably during the Babylonian captivity. And then in, uh, in uh, uh, Joshua, it writes of certain elements. He speaks of them holding the Passover feast. And uh, we, we, we've shown that uh, Jeremiah said that when the uh, Israelites left Egypt, that they weren't given any feasts and sacrifices to celebrate. And um, had that been written in Joshua at that time, he would have known all about that. And we show that uh, that was a contrivance. And we also show that the finding of the lost book, which we'll speak about just now, that speaks about the uh, Passover feast will show that there are issues related to that as well. So the priest went to great lengths to make these uh, contrivances plausible. And one of the big things that they did is after they returned from the Babylonian captivity, after uh, uh, quite a few years, 50 to 100 years, they wrote the Chronicles accounts. And uh, we see the Chronicles accounts therein, they actually support many of these contrivances to show that uh, they had knowledge of these things during the time of the kings. But the king's account don't uh, show these things, and we, we see that was part of the cover-up. And in fact, all of these contrivances that are backed up in the Chronicles account is actually evidence that they were fabrications. Part of these uh, contrivances were, first of all, in the Chronicles, they show support for the antediluvian genealogy and the flood, and they show this in 1 Chronicles 1, 1 to 27, uh, in the genealogy that they show there, and they speak of the flood and these pre-flood characters. And then we see they also show that David received the plans for the temple uh, in 1 Chronicles 28, 11, and 18 to 19. And we show that David didn't receive uh, plans for the temple in the king's accounts, and we've shown that archaeologists uh, tell us that Solomon's temple was built along the lines of temples generally built in the Levant and Mesopotamia at that time. And it wasn't a special design received from God. And that's not mentioned in the king's account. And we see uh, they go on in Chronicles and they show and they refer to the mercy seat. And this wasn't spoken uh, during the kings and also in the, uh, the Psalms. It doesn't uh, mention the mercy seat, the Psalms before the uh, Babylonian captivity. And that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 28, 11. And the, the Israelites wanted to show the, the, the permanent uh, exclusive presence of Jehovah in their uh, tabernacle and then in their temple. And we show that the reason they were doing this was that they wanted to equate their system with the Babylonian system that believed their gods built the temple. In other words, they had a design from God and that God, their gods personally dwell in their temples. And we show that God did not personally exclusively dwell in their tabernacle or temple of the Israelites. And we show that this was a contrivance and that Solomon, when dedicating his temple, stated that uh, his temple could not contain God and that God was in his abode in heaven. And that when they prayed that he would uh, kindly answer their prayer from heaven. And we showed that in the, uh, in the book. And then uh, they also show that the angels were allegedly affixed to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, shown in 1 Chronicles 28, 18 to 19. And we show that this isn't depicted in Solomon's temple, and that in fact Solomon had the freestanding cherubim, and that these cherubim would have been uh, beasts with wings, like, like winged sphinxes. And uh, that would have uh, been built by Hiram, the Phoenician, and um, the general trend was to build these things, uh, these sphinxes, and, and they wouldn't have been uh, human uh, likeness 
but they were uh, they were uh, sphinx, uh, sphinxes with wings. These large uh, uh, creatures that were built and placed into the uh, into the temple, into the inner sanctuary. And then we see Chronicles refers to the veil in the temple. That's Second Chronicles three fourteen, and this is not mentioned in the King's account. Solomon's temple had wooden paneling separating the inner from the outer sanctuary. And we show in the book that the veil would have been a later uh, inclusion or, or an addition to the temple. And that uh, what they wanted to do in their picture of the temple, they wanted to show that God gave them the, the design of the temple that was ransacked by the Babylonians. And therefore this temple had to show everything that happened at that time. And at that time there was a veil. But with Tol Solomon's temple there wasn't a veil in his temple. So that, that was a later addition. But they wanted to show if, 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 if the temple that was ransacked was designed by God, then it had to be the design of that temple that was ransacked. So we show that. And then they, they depict God purportedly descending from heaven to take up his seat on the Ark of the Covenant. That's 2 Chronicles 6.41. And we show that that wasn't the case. And that uh, God appeared at times in this temple, but never had a permanent residence within that temple. But they wanted to show that to equate with the Babylonian belief system. Then they also speak of the everlasting covenant for the land of Canaan, 1 Chronicles 16, 17 to 18, which isn't contained in the king's account. And we show that that uh, everlasting covenant was never known of. The kings uh, during that time, uh, when they ruled, they conquered peoples and they said God was adding land to them. And then when their enemies defeated them, they said uh, God was giving their land away to other peoples and never spoke of a covenant. And we've shown that the covenant and the land being sworn, sworn to them was first spoken of by Jeremiah and that he had an incorrect take on uh, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And we show that uh, in the book that's on a separate podcast. And uh, to show the extent of their fabrications and the eagerness to embellish the nature of events, we show that with the dedication of Solomon's temple in the Chronicles account, they show God bringing down fire and consuming the sacrifice. And bear in mind the Chronicles account was written about 500 years after the time of Solomon. And they wanted to show God coming down with fire and consuming the sacrifice. And we see that they also show references to a Passover feast and they try and back that up in, in, in 2 Chronicles 30, 13 to 18. Uh, they speak of this lost book uh, that was uh, spoken of, but uh, we see that the uh, Passover feast uh, wasn't mentioned in the... Uh, it's mentioned in the King's accounts, but we show that just now. We'll show it as a fabrication that was created as, as, as a point of reference to, to back up the fa uh, fabrications. And then we see that the uh, Feast of Tabernacles was also uh, shown in Chronicles, but... This was also written in there to support that, so that wasn't uh, that wasn't there. So those uh, those uh, particular things were written after the time to support the various things. We show also that uh, certain writings produced after the captivity in Psalms and in Chronicles speak of this everlasting covenant, and it was to actually support their contrivances. Now, what we're going to do is we're just going to show, and, and we realized in the investigation that. Uh, the Israelitish priests during the captivity, they wrote novel psalms speaking of this great exodus from Egypt and, and the everlasting covenant and various things. And they placed these into the Psalter at specific points. And, and the way they placed them in, from a forensic investigative perspective, it shows you that they were trying to cover their tracks and trying to support a various, uh, their various uh, contrivances. And uh, we found that all of these additions, uh, that they usually quote exilic circumstances, i.e. speak of the destruction of Jerusalem or speak of Babylon, and are clearly grouped with other exilic or post-exilic psalms. And secondly, that at times they are grouped uh, with psalms that were clearly written at a later time in an endeavor to show that these were pre-exilic but are actually exilic and post-exilic. An example of this is Psalm 68, produced after the captivity which was written in an endeavor to show that the revelation of uh, Jehovah was made during the time of Moses. And uh, we speak about that in one of the chapters of the book. And another example is Psalm 105, 8 to 11, that is clearly styled on 1 Chronicles 16, 15 to 18, and grouped with other post-exilic psalms. So we see that uh, we can see and identify psalms that were clearly post-exilic and placed into the Psalter. 
And we showed that the Psalms commence from the end of the second and fourth Psalm books and are interspersed within the third and fifth Psalm books. And it can be seen that these were initially placed at the end of certain books with none of these Psalms appearing in the original first and second Psalm books, uh, evidencing these being placed into the Psalms at a later time during and after the Babylonian captivity. So from a forensic uh, perspective, we see that these uh, Psalms, the way that they were placed in and the uh, Psalms that they were grouped with shows that this was a cover-up. Uh, the first batch is Psalm 66, 67, 68, and 69. We've mentioned Psalm 68. It was a um, it was styled on the uh, judge's account where the Lord uh, purportedly descended on Mount Seir and brought the rains and uh, came across to them and the southern kingdom, uh, the rains assisted them in uh, defeating Sisera and his armies, showing that that happened during 1125 BC, during the time of Deborah. But they wrote 60 Psalm to try and uh, show that that uh, happened during the time of, uh, of Moses. And, and Judges 5, it, it says, uh, the Lord went, the Lord, uh, uh, sorry, Judges 5 from verse 4, Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked and the heavens also dripped, uh, even uh, the clouds dripped water and the mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord, the Sinai, the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel, and etc., etc. And then it goes on to say that they chose new gods. But that same wording is placed in Psalm 68. It says, O God, when you went forth before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, uh, Selah, the earth quaked and the heaven also dropped rain at the presence of God and Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. In Psalm 68, they're trying to show the, uh, the Mount Sinai, but we've shown that the, it was never a Mount Sinai. The word Sinai is, is the moon god, Sin. And when the initial judge's account speaks of Sinai quaked, it, it, it's, the, uh, it's the moon god, Sin, quaked on the mountain. And we show that the Ed Edomites used to worship the moon god, Sin. So when Jehovah came... Uh, moon god sin quaked and, and disappeared so we show that uh, uh, those uh, psalm 68 we show 69 uh, is post uh, exilic and mentions the cities of judah being rebuilt that they may again dwell therein uh, at 69 uh, 35 and uh, psalm 66 is post exilic and speaks of the israelites crossing the sea on dry land and the river jordan on foot and uh, we've seen and we quoted various examples here stating that the wording is post-exilic and we show that in the book. And also Psalm 67 is also post-exilic. Uh, post so we show that those were batched together as post-exilic psalms at the end of the second psalm book. Um, and then the second batch, uh, Psalm 74, 77, 78 and 79 within Psalm book 3. Now we show that Psalm Book 3 purports to be the Psalms of Asaph, uh, with many of these Psalms seen as post-exilic, and we give the references for that. Uh, the post-exilic connection can be seen with Psalm 74, 78, and 79 that reveal exilic elements. Psalm 74 speaks of the damage that occurs to the sanctuary during the Babylonian captivity and mentions that, that God had dwelt there. In other words, they were under the impression that God had departed from there. And, and that's shown in uh, Psalm 74. So we see these matched once again in a group of uh, post-exilic psalms. And we put the full wording of the psalms and we underline all the uh, pieces that show the issues with that. And uh, we, we show that clearly. And the next batch is Psalm 105, 106, 107 at the end of Book 4 and the start of Book 5. And uh, we can see there that the Psalm 105, which mentions the everlasting covenant for the land of Canaan being given to the Israelites as an everlasting possession, was derived from 1 Chronicles 16, 15 to 18, uh, which emerged uh, after the Babylonian captivity when Chronicles was written. So the same wording is in Psalm 105 as uh, 1 Chronicles 16. And uh, many people have mentioned that in the various commentaries on that. And then we see, uh, coupled with this, is Psalm 106, which is regarded as post-exilic, uh, and implores God to gather the Israelites black back from among the nations, and we mentioned that in the particular book there. We show also Psalm 107 appears to be post-exilic, and that it speaks of God gathering them back from the lands in the east, the west, the north, the south. So we see that many of these elements uh, in these psalms are post-exilic, and one can see that they were actually placed 
placed into the into the Psalter. And then Psalms 135, 136, 137, part of Psalm Book 5. And we see Psalm 137 and speaks of uh, being by the rivers of Babylon. And we can see all these, those Psalms are post-exilic. And one can clearly see that they were placed in there after the time. So we show that uh, uh, the priests went to great uh, lengths to actually make their stories plausible. They actually wrote of this exodus from Egypt and going through the dry uh, land when the sea parted and all these various things. But they're all written under suspect conditions and they placed with uh, exilic uh, elements and some of them themselves have got exilic elements in them and, and that they placed at the end of the psalm book. One must remember that those psalm books were in scrolls and you couldn't just uh, include it so you had to write it and then later when you did a revision you added them on to the end of the book or wherever and that's what happened here in these cases. So we show that that clearly happened and that they were covering their tracks in terms of these contrivances and we show it clearly. Then one of the other things they did, uh, the, uh, the priest devised the story about a lost book that was found during the time of Josiah and through this added novel concepts to the rewritten uh, foundation document. <coughs> Uh, we see that they speak of this lost book that happened during the time of Josiah. And in, in, this, uh, in this lost book, they actually speak of this uh, book speaking of the, uh, of the Passover feast that nobody knew of before that time. And it, it's in 2 Kings 22, it starts from verse 8. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan who read it. And then in 2 Kings 23 from verse 3, it says the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and his soul and to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant and then verse 21. And then the king commanded all the people saying celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. Surely such a Passover had not been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in the days of uh, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, the Passover was observed to the Lord in Jerusalem. Uh, we show that this was a contrivance, and we can see that, for instance, uh, Jeremiah, and, and Jeremiah prophesied uh, 10, 20 years before the captivity, and he prophesied through the captivity, and after the captivity went to Egypt. And Jeremiah... Um, would have prophesied after the time of Josiah. Josiah was a king for, for, for many years. But it says in the 18th year of King Josiah, which would have been before this time of uh, Jeremiah, and uh, they say in the lost book that they were to hold this Passover feast, and of course they would have held it every year because it, it's, uh, that's what it says about the feast, that it should be held every year. And... Uh, we see that uh, had this been held, then Jeremiah would never have spoken and said that when, we, when the Israelites left Egypt, they never received uh, instructions from God regarding sacrifices and feasts. And uh, so he wouldn't have, uh, he wouldn't have known of that. Uh, so obviously this was a fabrication that was written into the account. Written into the account. This book was purportedly left unnoticed for about 800 years uh, since the time that it would have been written by Moses. And it would have moved about from Shiloh to Jerusalem to the, uh, to, the, to the temple and it was in the temple. And all these people that knew and wanted to know everything about God and read all the writings, they would have left this, uh, this unattended to. This, this really doesn't, uh, doesn't seem plausible. And uh, so we see that uh, because of Jeremiah's statement, it wouldn't have been held. And then secondly, they wrote this into Joshua. It speaks of holding the Passover feast. And had uh, Jeremiah had access to Joshua, he would have known all about that feast, but he, he doesn't know of it. And we show also in the book, and we found this correspondence from, uh, from Babylon during the reign of Darius, and it was a letter to the Alexandrian Jews, and it was showing them how to more perfectly hold this Passover feast. So the Alexandrian Jews who didn't come to Babylon with the rest of the Jews where this feast was established, they weren't too sure how to hold this Passover feast and this letter was sent to them and we quoted the full letter in the book so you'll be able to see that. So there's plenty of evidence to show that this was a major contrivance that this lost book never occurred. And this lost book would have been used to introduce new concepts to the people and they would have related these and said, no, these would have been written 
in this lost book that was found in the, in, in, in the, in, in the temple. But we show that there was no lost book particular found in that temple. So we see that the, uh, that the, uh, that the Israelite priests went to great lengths to make these stories plausible. They first of all wrote, rewrote the Pentateuch, they rewrote Joshua and Judges, and then they uh, wrote uh, Chronicles accounts after they returned from the Babylonian captivity, supporting all these feasts. And then they wrote particular Psalms and they placed them into the Psalter uh, to try and support their contrivances. But one can see in the way that they placed them in that these were, uh, these were actually uh, written in support of their contrivances. And the main reason for the contrivances was their uh, survivalist strategy. They wanted to show that they had an everlasting covenant and that God brought them miraculously day by day uh, through the miracles and then through the Red Sea when they passed on dry land and then sustained them in the wilderness with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and then took them and gave them manna in the wilderness and we discuss all these things and show the issues to them and then when they get to Canaan they cross the river and the water banks up and then they go in and purportedly try and annihilate all those people that God showed them to do. And we show that, that that's not in the character of God. And that uh, that was their own will and desire once they settled in that land. And they started to intermarry with the peoples. And then uh, that happened over a protracted period because it happened with many of the tribes. And it probably was uh, 10, 20 years that it had happened. And uh, through the, uh, the separation of these people's fights and arguments were, uh, broke out and then they went to war with this pe these people and then they decided in their own hearts uh, they're going to annihilate these people. And we show that uh, in the book. And the fact that they were to eliminate the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hibersites, uh, the Hivites, which they mentioned previously, uh, purportedly, when they were leaving Egypt, we show that that was written back into the account to show that God told them to do that, and we, we may mention that this was actually a contrivance. And it was all written from a uh, survivalist uh, strategy, because they were in a time of extreme crisis, and that uh, they were threatened with losing their national identity. We're going to finish our podcast here. Remember, these books are available on Amazon.com and uh, BookBaby.com. Just do a search under Ernest Austin Adams. Thank you for watching.